Let's get electrified. Yes, today there is a greater demand for electrification than ever before. Electric cars, electric bikes, electric toothbrushes. Okay, those have been around for a long time, but I just got my first one, so does that count? <laughs> and this trend toward electrification isn't going to slow down anytime soon. But how can we make our design lives easier when it comes to this new wave of electrified electronic designs? Power modules. But not just any power modules. We need advanced miniaturization and innovative modular packaging. And where can we find all of that and more? Vicor's Power Modules. That's where. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. In this episode of Chalk Talk, David Krakauer from Vicor and I explore the evolution of battery technology and the specific benefits that power modules bring to battery formation, battery testing, and battery recycling. We also investigate what sets Vicor power modules apart from other solutions on the market today and how you can take advantage of Vicor power modules in your next design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Vicor. Hi, David. Thank you so much for joining me. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So we're talking about the evolution of the battery ecosystem and the trends driving a new wave of electrification. But David, before we get started, we're seeing a bigger and bigger demand for electrification across a lot of different industries, right? Absolutely. A lot of the demand is coming from mostly in the automotive space where the adoption of electric vehicles is driving the use and the need for a lot of batteries and battery cells. But the demand is coming from a number of other applications, including robotics and drones and even recreational products like dirt bikes. As you can see from this chart, the demand is more than doubling every few years. One way to look at how the demand is being met and its connection to power converters is to think about what we call the life cycle of the battery. Okay, so let's talk about that life cycle of a battery. David, what steps are involved? Well, it starts from how the battery cells are first manufactured. We won't go into the manufacturing process itself, but once the cell is created, it needs to be formed and tested. Those cells are then combined into larger battery packs. And in this phase, the cells are tested again and they're binned out so they can be matched with other cells in a battery pack. And then that pack is further tested to make sure it meets all of its requirements and then is used in a number of those applications that we just talked about. Perhaps the most interesting part of the life cycle is at the end where companies are now starting to recycle those batteries to recover the materials so that they can be reused in new batteries. Okay, so what are the biggest challenges within each of these phases of the life cycle? Yeah, so each phase has slightly different challenges. There's some similarities, but you can really identify each phase by a particular challenge that they face. So if we start off at the beginning where the cells are formed and tested, there's a considerable amount of energy that's expended to charge and discharge the battery cell, something that we can talk about a little bit later in greater detail. When you get to the testing phase, what matters there is throughput because they've got to test as many batteries and battery packs as possible so the manufacturers can reduce the cost and preserve their capital expenditures. When you move over to the applications in that third phase of the life cycle, some of the things that are important are size and weight as well as efficiency. And then in the final stage, recycling, the process of extracting those materials, it not only uses quite a bit of energy, but it also generates a tremendous amount of heat and that creates a harsh environment and that puts a significant emphasis on reliability. Okay, so David, what are the power requirements for each of these phases and what are we looking at in this case? What's interesting here is that even though the challenges are a little bit different in each of the phases, the power requirements are actually pretty similar across each of these different phases. 
Each phase needs high power density and efficiency to try to reduce overall size. High input voltages are needed in each case, especially as battery packs are growing up to 800 volts and beyond. And they're formed and tested off of similar inputs, typically 380 or 480 volt AC or DC grid. Flexibility and scalability of the power delivery network, it's also important for each particular phase as these are very fast moving markets and they're evolving very quickly. So the power delivery requirements are changing constantly. So to keep up with that pace, it's important to have a power solution that can be easily scaled to accommodate higher voltages and power levels. And of course, reliability and efficiency are also important in each one of these phases. So we've talked a lot over the years about power modules here on Chalk Talk, and that is definitely a solution to consider here, right? Absolutely. Power modules are ideal in addressing the technical needs of each phase of the life cycle here. Compact power modules have very high power density, higher than any other solution, while still delivering the high efficiency and high voltage and current capability that's needed in most of these battery-related systems today. So what do you think are the biggest benefits of this kind of modular approach? So the benefits, they're similar to what we've already talked about a little bit, but most power delivery networks that are built from high-performance power modules, they offer a lot of flexibility and scalability. And as we'll show in a little bit with some examples, they offer other benefits as well. For example, power modules in thermally adept packaging, that enables a lot easier thermal management. It gives you better performance, it gives you much better reliability, and it can reduce overall cost. Fantastic. So David, how do Vicor power modules compare with discrete solutions? That's a great question. It's one of the questions I love answering because Discrete solutions are probably the biggest alternative solution to a power module. That usually requires a lot of expertise to develop a complete power solution, whereas power modules, they're more like, think of them as building blocks, like Legos, if you will, where you can easily lay them down and get the particular power delivery network that you're looking for in a modular form. With discrete power solutions, that level of expertise that's needed it's becoming increasingly difficult to find the right skill set to do that. And in particular, when you think about a lot of these markets that we're talking about, the experts in these companies, the experts that are architecting these very innovative systems and products, they are not power experts. They're focusing on, for example, in an electrified dirt bike, they're focusing on the dirt bike, not on necessarily how to deliver power. And so that level of expertise in power design just isn't there. But then there are also the technical differences and benefits to power modules. So when you look at getting more scalability and flexibility, if you're trying to make a modification to a discrete power solution, it requires redesigning the entire system. Whereas with a power module, very often you can lay down another module to increase the power level that you need. And then there are the other benefits that we've talked about before. You can typically get a lot more of a compact solution using a modular system. And last but not least, the power modules, especially the Vicor power modules, they're already qualified. They already achieve the level of performance out of the box that you can't get from a discrete power solution. So there's no need to qualify and re-qualify as you would if you were using a discrete solution. That makes sense. Now, David, can we also take a closer look at each phase of that battery life cycle? It starts with cell formation, right? Absolutely. So that first phase is the battery cell itself. And after the cell is manufactured, the actual cell is built, it has to undergo a formation process, which is really the first time the battery is charged and then it's discharged. This process establishes the lifetime and the characteristics of the battery and it impacts the overall quality and reliability of that cell. The uh, limiting factor here is that it is incredibly time intensive. And in some cases it can take days to complete. And it's also energy intensive because the battery cell is repeatedly charged and discharged. With the growing demand for more batteries, the battery cell formation part of this, it's not only a bottleneck, it's also a key cost driver. It's very expensive to do this over a long period of time. 
So to improve the situation, battery manufacturers are looking for ways to recycle the energy that's used in the formation process. And they can do this by discharging back onto the grid or onto a storage cell to recycle the energy instead of just dumping all that charge into the ground. And they're also looking for ways to improve throughput so they can reduce the capital expenses. The formation process is dictated by battery chemistry, so they really can't speed up the process for a given chemistry. But what they can do is they can work to execute the process on as many battery cells as possible at the same time in the same physical space to increase that throughput. And they need to be nimble to respond to those changing battery chemistries. So if they identify a better battery chemistry and they need to change their system that might have a different voltage or different current requirements, then they're going to need a power delivery solution that can be easily and quickly modified to meet those changes. Overall, what are the biggest advantages of a power module approach here? Well, in addition to being flexible and scalable to meet the rapidly changing voltage and current requirements, as I just mentioned, they also need to be extremely power dense to try to reduce overall space. And then the right modules can also be bidirectional. And what that means is you can then recycle the energy that's being used to charge and discharge the battery cells. Power is then able to flow in both directions. So you can put energy into the battery to charge it and then back onto the grid when you discharge it to store it on site for use in the next round of charging or discharging. And I should point out that if you were building a discrete solution or if you were buying something off the shelf, you might actually have to buy two solutions or design two solutions in parallel, one going in one direction, one going in the other. Whereas power modules, when done in the right way, like the Vicor power modules, they are inherently bi-directional. So you're automatically right then and there reducing the overall size that's needed in half. And if you want, we can take a look at an example of a power delivery network that shows this. So here we see the power coming off of the mains and it's being rectified and converted to a 400 volt DC signal or power level. And that 400 volts is then converted down to 12 volts through an isolated fixed ratio bus converter module. Fixed ratio conversion has advantages over regulated conversion. And most significantly, that's because you get very, very high efficiency and very low EMI. The right bus converter module that's fixed ratio can be nearly 98% efficient and needs only a very small EMI input filter. The 12 volts at the other end of the fixed ratio converter is then bucked down to the appropriate cell voltage. In the example we're showing here, it's 4.2 volts. Now in some architectures, the people designing these systems, they might take that 400 volts down to 24 or 48 volts from the bus converter. And that choice relates to how one wishes to optimize the system given the various requirements in terms of how much current is needed and how much space is available. In this example, you can also see that the full power delivery path is bidirectional. The yellow lines put the charge on the battery cells and the green lines discharge those cells and put the energy back onto the grid. What makes this solution work as well as it does is because those bus converter mo modules are bidirectional. Okay, that makes sense. Now, can you show us an example of one of these bidirectional modules? Sure, here's an example of one. This is the BCM6123. It's an extremely power dense fixed ratio bus converter module that can deliver up to 1.6 kilowatts in a very small 63 by 23 square millimeter package. Now this particular model can be used to convert 400 volts down to 48 volts and it's truly bidirectional. That enables the energy savings we talked about without adding cost or taking up additional board space. The Vicor BCM products come in a variety of power levels with different input voltages and what we call K factors to provide a range of output voltages. And because they're fixed ratio, they always have the lowest and cleanest EMI signatures as well as the highest possible efficiency. In this case, as I noted earlier, nearly 98%. They're ideal not only for the battery cell formation, but for most other battery applications. For example, to divide or multiply the battery voltage to create a virtual battery. All right, so can we talk about the testing phase of the battery life cycle you mentioned? 
Sure. Once the cell is completed, then that's when the battery pack is formed. And battery pack production isn't constrained by the same time intensive requirements as battery cell formation. They don't need to be repeatedly charged and discharged. But this phase is still faced with a similar throughput challenge. Each cell has to be tested and accurately measured so that the cells can be properly combined. They have to be matched with one another to form a larger battery pack. Once that's done, then the pack needs to be tested to make sure it conforms to the right level of performance and functionality. This isn't exactly a value add step. When you have to test something to make sure it works, that's a necessary evil. You have to do it, but it doesn't make the product any better. It just makes the product meet, verifies rather, that the product meets its requirements. So the faster it can be done, the lower the cost of the battery pack can be. Now, whereas flexibility and scalability are needed in the formation process to accommodate changing chemistries, that same flexibility and scalability, it's also needed here because battery packs have a wide variety of voltage and power levels. So the test equipment needs to be able to deliver those in different varieties. And so if you need to scale your system, then you need to change your power delivery network. And that way, battery test designers can do it quickly based on using these power modules. So keeping the power module approach in mind, what kind of advantages would you see when it comes to battery testing? Well, there are some compelling advantages similar to the previous example. The power modules can deliver kilowatts of power in a very small form factor, and that reduces the physical size of the tester. And that same fixed ratio conversion that we looked at earlier also has very fast settling times, which can speed up the testing process. Throughput is very, very important in this particular phase. And of course, as I've noted a couple of times, the modular approach is very flexible and scalable. Now here's a, an example, here's another power delivery network, but this is used in battery pack testing. Now in this case, you've got 800 volts coming off the mains and that's being converted down to 12 volts to test the battery packs. And from there, there's a simple buck converter from that 12 volts that can take the voltage down to the appropriate cell level. There are additional peripherals in the test system that also need to be powered. And here we can see that there's a fixed ratio BCM that's taking 800 volts down efficiently to 48 volts and then down to 12 volts and six volts using regulated modules. It's worth noting that this is just one configuration and different test systems may use and very likely use very different voltage combinations and even different power sources. If, for example, the AC line in were replaced by a direct high voltage DC into the building, as some are considering, then these 800 volt BCM modules could be readily replaced by lower voltage BCM modules without much change to the rest of the power delivery network. And that just emphasizes the flexibility and scalability of this approach. In fact, if any of the voltage or power requirements were to change, again, you could just simply replace or add power modules as needed without having to significantly redesign and also very importantly, requalify that power delivery network. Okay, so can we also talk about the actual use of batteries in an application as well? Yes, this is actually probably the, the more fun part. This is where we get into some really, really interesting applications. So, you know, while the main driver of the market in electrification is electric cars, I thought maybe a more fun example would be to show an electric bike and not just a simple e-bike, but a more powerful bike with a more complex drivetrain and other electronics. So what we're showing here is a high performance bike. And like many electrified mobile applications, Bikes like this, they have a very limited budget for space. The people that are designing these, they're designing them for performance, in some cases for aesthetics, for ergonomics. They are very limited in terms of how much space that they can allot to where the battery is going to go and the power system. So minimizing the form factor of a power solution without compromising performance is critical. And of course, battery life, which translates to range in this application, that's also a key consideration. Weight also factors into range. So the lighter, in this case, the lighter the bike, the further it can go. So keeping the power delivery network as light as possible is important. So 
this is a clearly a case where power density, both in terms of power delivered relative to volume and weight, as well as efficiency, are really, really important. The other thing to think about is that markets like this are evolving very rapidly. And so that requires engineers to move quickly to get new bikes with different performance levels on the road as quickly as possible. And just by way of example, we're working with companies who are doing, say, dirt bikes and road bikes. And they have very different power requirements, but they start from the same module-based power delivery network, and they can make slight modifications as they go along to adapt to the different power levels, voltage, and current requirements. Excellent. Now, what do you think are the biggest advantages of a modular approach to power delivery in this case? Well, I have to apologize because I, I feel like I'm going to repeat myself talking about these advantages because once again, it's about power density, it's about efficiency, flexibility, all of those are beneficial in this application and they are a direct result of using a modular approach. It's worth really highlighting again that flexibility advantage which speaks to ease of use. As I noted earlier, the people that are designing bikes like this, they're focused on the bike. They're not necessarily focused on the power delivery network. So making it easier for those system architects to design and not have to worry about a discrete solution, that's a real benefit to them. And in addition to being able to quickly modify the power delivery network by swapping in and out the power modules, these power modules are designed to be very low noise. And the low EMI from these modules simplifies filtering and further reduces the size of any filter solution and the overall power delivery network. If modules are swapped in and out, then the changes to those filter, it's minimal and it reduces the design time considerably. So here's a very, very basic, very simple example of a power delivery network. We've kept it simple on purpose because there are so many variations that are possible, but typically it comes down to a high voltage battery, in this case, 400 volts, that's gonna support the electronics throughout the bike. A wide input voltage range accommodates changes in the battery voltage and the precise output of this isolated, regulated DC-DC converter module that ensures proper operation of the loads and the backup battery charging. Now, in some cases, a single isolated DC-DC converter module, such as one of the Vicor DCM products, that could be used to power all of the loads, or depending on the number and size of the loads, additional DCMs can be used just by placing them in parallel. So, David, can you tell us a bit more about these DCM products? Sure. The DCM products are typically isolated, some are non-isolated, but they are, you can think of them as complete DC-DC converters. They can be used at the point of load within a power delivery network to provide very accurate voltage levels and high power. And interestingly, the power can be scaled by simply using up to, in most cases, about eight of these products in parallel, and there's no power derating. And as you can see here, they have a very wide input range, or they're available in different levels of input ranges. So they work very, very well in a battery application, and they're also very power dense. So they fit very nicely in some of the applications that we've talked about. So we also need to talk about recycling, right? There are a lot of issues to contend with here, correct? Yes. Battery recycling is interesting because there are a lot of materials used in batteries. And as we get to the end of a life of battery, People are becoming increasingly concerned about dumping those into landfills, and they're also concerned, obviously, about the cost of manufacturing batteries and the raw materials that are involved. So the ability to reclaim that material is really, really important, and this is where we can have an impact not only to the consumer, but more importantly, to the environment. So in battery recycling, which is a fairly new market and a pretty exciting one, high currents are used in electroplating baths in factories to extract and reform materials such as copper into rolls that can be then reused in battery production. Those materials are then sent back to the battery manufacturers for reuse. Now this is an extremely energy intensive operation. Unlike battery cell formation, there isn't the same opportunity to reclaim the energy because the energy is fully expended in the process. But like most production related operations, productivity and throughput are critical. And because this is a fast-growing market with more and more batteries in need of material reclamation, 
there's a need to get to market quickly with increasingly efficient and compact systems. So when it comes to battery recycling, what advantages do power modules bring? So this is where the fixed ratio approach to DC-DC conversion really shines. And that's because, as I noted earlier, this is a very energy intensive process where you can't reclaim the energy. So you have to be as efficient as possible in how you use that energy. So fixed ratio converters that can achieve up to 98% efficiency, that's gonna give you your best shot at using the least amount of energy as possible. In addition, reliability is very important because the factory environment can become very, very hot. So you need to be in a thermally adept package so you can pull the heat out of these converters, but also you want these converters to be very reliable in that harsh environment. And then of course, power density is very important. These systems are evolving very rapidly. We're talking to manufacturers who their first systems are the size of a room and their second generation, they're trying to get them down to the size of a closet and eventually they're trying to get them down to the size of a small box. And so every component needs to be as dense as possible. And that's where power dense converter modules are really, really important. To give you an example of how they might be used, we have another example of a power delivery network. Again, these are just very simplified examples because people are doing their own implementations, but it gives you a good idea of what these system designers are trying to do. So in this simple power delivery network example, the bus converter modules are used to take 400 volts down to a variety of voltages, 12, 24, and 48, that are gonna be used to execute the extraction process. Now, interestingly, one could simplify this even further. That gray box that you see between the AC line and the 400 volts, that's intended to represent an AC-DC power factor correction converter or a three-phase rectifier that's coming from the industrial grid mains or some kind of low voltage transformer station. But interestingly, it could also be a solar array and a buffer battery going straight into the BCM. So some factories are looking at doing that as a way to further reduce the overall use of energy. And an example of a bus converter module that might be used would be something like this. This is a BCM 6135. And it's an example that's currently being used in this application as well as other battery related applications. And like the BCM 6123, it has very high efficiency, close to 98%. But this one has even higher power capability and correspondingly much higher power density. And it's also worth noting that these modules are assembled in thermally adept packaging for double-sided water cooling. And it makes it much easier to manage in that harsh high temperature factory environment that I noted earlier. And that speaks to improving and ensuring system level reliability. Okay, so bringing it all together, what do you think are the most important aspects of a modular approach here? Well, the theme throughout this conversation is really about the different attributes that you see here. It's really about the flexibility and scalability in a fast growing market, that high power density and efficiency that reduces power loss in a compact space, the robustness in terms of the ability to easily manage the thermals in modules, and then of course the reliability and faster time to market. All right. So David, what sets Bicor power modules apart from other solutions on the market today? Well, I think it's worth noting that not all power modules are the same. They don't offer all these advantages. And in fact, some people talk about power modules very uh, generally, where the, really what they're talking about is a bunch of passive or active devices that are just put into a common package. This is very different. We've been investing in many key technologies that enable this high level of performance, high density in all of our power modules. And it's really a complete solution as opposed to a bunch of similar devices that are just arrayed in a package. In order to achieve this, it takes a lot of advanced miniaturization. And we implement that in a highly automated production environment. The manufacturing aspect of power modules is very, very important to try to get all these components reliably and with high quality into a small package. It also involves proprietary power topologies that can reduce noise, as I noted earlier, increase the density and reduce power losses. 
And it all comes down to that packaging technology, how we can put all of this together in these very, very compact packages. Okay, so speaking of packaging, what kind of options do you guys offer when it comes to packaging? Well, there are a number of different options, and they're really broken out by the different generations that we've gone through over the years. And you can see here three generations of packaging technology. And you can also see how each generation has significantly reduced the size of the package. And actually, in just a matter of a few years, we've been able to achieve a 10x increase in overall power density. So if you compare that second generation to that fourth generation, if you just look at that power density, it is significantly, significantly improved. And upcoming generations are going to take that density one step further with the packages having not only a smaller footprint, but as you can tell from the evolution of these packages, they get thinner and thinner and thinner. And here are some of the products that we talked about today, and you can see the variety of the packaging here as well. So you have the BCM6135 and the BCM6123, those isolated fixed ratio DC-DC converters that give you that very, very high efficiency. And then, of course, the DCM family of regulated DC-DC converters that also give very high power density. But you can think of those as a more complete, isolated, and regulated DC-DC converter. All right. So this was a lot to take in, David. But before you go, can you recap your main points for me? Absolutely. So I think the common theme here as it relates to Vicor's high-performance power modules in this life cycle of the battery and all the different phases, the technology really delivers on the various needs within each phase. So there's high throughput that's needed to meet growing demand, particularly in the battery cell formation and testing, as well as the battery pack testing. High efficiency and bidirectionality help to conserve energy. The modularity of these products helps with flexibility and scalability that enables the players in this market to respond to fast-changing market dynamics. And then, of course, high reliability that keeps factories and battery-powered applications running smoothly. Fantastic. Well, David, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Vicor. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.